Hey everybody, in this video, I'm gonna wrap up the whole process of neurotransmission, starting with the relationship between stimulus strength and greater potentials, and how that can lead to the creation of an action potential, and ultimately neurotransmitter release, and the signaling between two different neurons. Now on the left side here, you see that I have three graphs, orange for stimulus strength, green for greater potential, yellow for action potential, and the right, act, right side of the screen, I have a dark blue neuron representing the presynaptic neuron, which will communicate and send signals to the postsynaptic neuron shown in turquoise on the lower right part of the screen. Now what we'll start with is going to be stimulus strength. And a stimulus is going to be any kind of sensory signal that is going to be detected by a neuron. And of course, a stimulus can vary in strength. So for this, you can think of a smell that is weak versus extremely overpowering and strong. Someone's touch, which could be a gentle brush of the hand versus putting their hand on top of yours moderately versus pressing down and putting a lot of pressure on your hand. So a stimulus can clearly change in size. So for example, you might get a stimulus that is weak, moderate, and very strong. So in other words, you get a stimulus that is kind of gentle, stronger, and if you want, you could say strongest. Now, the stimulus is going to be detected at the dendrites of the neurons. This is the source of input. And at these dendrites, with a detection of a stimulus, you will get a graded potential. And a graded potential, by definition of being graded, means it can change in size. So what this means is that at rest, you have a graded potential that is flat. It's at rest. And then with a weak stimulus, it'll go up a little bit, but not reach that dashed line. And that dashed line represents threshold. And threshold is the level that needs to be reached in order for an action potential to be generated and ultimately so that way you can detect what that stimulus is. Now for a moderate stimulus we'll say it reaches threshold. Now what's going to happen here is an action potential is going to be created as soon as it hits that threshold. For a very large stimulus it's going to go past threshold and I'll show you what happens with an action potential. So the relationship here that you can kind of see here is that for the most part, as the stimulus strength increases, the greater potential strength increases at the same time. So they end up being pretty equal in amplitudes or heights. Now greater potential is also short distance. That's another hallmark of it. It's meaning it goes from dendrites to the cell body where the cell body will be excited to create an action potential which is going to go long distance and again ultimately to your brain. Now the greater potential along with the action potential is going to be measured in voltage. So put that down here on the action potential as well. And one big difference between an action potential and a graded potential is the fact that an action potential is not going to vary in size with stimulus strength. So in other words, it's an all or none process. You either reach threshold and get an action potential or you do not. So I have here a lower dashed line which is going to represent resting membrane potential. And for a neuron, it's about negative 65. Now, for a greater potential that's weak, it might go up a bit, never reach threshold, and then back down. So you will never receive an action potential, and you therefore you do not detect what that signal is. Now, let's say you have a greater potential that reaches threshold. What this is going to create is it's going to create an action potential, and because it just barely reached threshold, it's going to create a single action potential. 
And that single action potential is going to, again, ultimately reach your brain and tell you, hey, there is a stimulus there, but it's not very strong. Now, what happens if you have a very strong stimulus with a big graded potential that goes well past threshold? Well, the result is you create an action potential that is going to be the same size as any other action potential, but you're going to create several of them. So in other words, as stimulus strength increases, the graded potential size increases, but the frequency of action potential increases. So that is a key point here. And again, I'll say it again, the stimulus strength will increase, which means the graded potential size will increase, which means the actual potential frequency will increase. And all of this gets transmitted to your brain so that way you can interpret a signal, aka stimulus, as being weak, moderate, or strong, just based on how many action potentials the brain is receiving. Now the action potential originally is generated at the axon hillock, and as it travels down a myelinated neuron, which I have shown here, it is going to be regenerated at each node of Ranvier. So that's another key, key point, that you do not just create a single action potential up here, you need to create a new one at several time points down along the axon. And the reason for this is because any electrical signal does not have an infinite strength. It is eventually going to dissipate as it travels down the axon. So you start off with a certain size and it decreases. And if you did not create a new action potential here, it would never reach the axon terminals at the very end of the neuron. So you need to create a new one at each point. And what you end up with at the very end is an actual potential, or you can kind of think of it as kind of a series of repeated brand new action potentials reaching the axon terminals, which is where neurotransmitter release will happen. Now, before we get to a neurotransmitter release, I just want to briefly go through again what is going on during an action potential. Now, remember, for an action potential, you need to keep in mind the concentrations of sodium and concentrations of potassium inside versus outside of the cell. Now, at rest, you have a lot of sodium outside. Now, remember that this is because sodium-potassium pumps are pumping three sodiums out and two potassiums in. Now you have voltage-gated potassium channels that are shut, and you have voltage-gated sodium channels that are shut. You have leak potassium channels that open, close, open, close, open, close, that will allow some potassium to leak back out, and then you pump it back in in order to keep sodium from flooding inside the cell and you keep sodium outside. The, the key point here is that you keep potassium inside and you keep sodium outside. And this is at rest. So this relates to this time point right there. Now when you need to excite the neuron or you get the, in, the initial graded potential that excites the neuron and you get an action potential that's going to be this part here the rising phase or depolarization now during this part you have the potassium leak channels that are still opening and closing opening and closing you have the sodium potassium pumps which are not shown here still pumping three sodiums out, two potassiums in. You have the voltage-gated potassium channels that are trying to open because they get activated by reaching threshold. 
but they're slow, so they do not open. So potassium goes nowhere. But what gets opened up are these sodium voltage-gated channels. Now they open up, and what happens is you have all this sodium out here, and it rushes in to this cell where there's less sodium, and you end up with a situation where the inside of the neuron is no longer negative because now you have a whole bunch of sodium and you have a whole bunch of potassium, tons of positive ions inside. Now this is that rising phase, right? And it goes up to about a positive 40 level. And that was a big change, a big change from a level of about negative 65. Now what needs to happen after that is going to be repolarization. So this is going to be where the leak potassium channels still doing their thing, sodium potassium pumps still doing their thing, but now the voltage gated sodium channels are done, they're inactivated, and that's what it ends up looking like. That sodium can't go anywhere except being pumped out by the, by the sodium potassium pumps. But now the voltage gated potassium channels are open. And where does potassium go? Outside of that neuron. So it's going to drive the neuron back towards that negative spectrum because you are losing hundreds of potassium ions outside, plus you are pumping out three sodiums for every two potassiums you bring back in. So that is what's going to drive this really straight down at a fast pace towards this resting potential of negative 65. Now you do have this, this situation, right, where it ends up being a little bit too, too negative inside, past resting membrane potential. And the reason for that is because the voltage-gated potassium channels, just like they're open to close or slow to open, they're going to be slow to close. But once they do close, you get back to this resting situation where leak channels are pumping potassium out or losing potassium out. So that way you can pump the sodium that was originally all inside you're starting to put the sodium back to normal outside and you end up with a lot more potassium back inside all over again. Now for more clarification on this whole process of an action potential, you can certainly watch the prior video to this in which I go through uh, the action potential process in more detail. Now, where we left off after this action potential is the fact that you transmitted an action potential all the way down here to an axon terminal. Okay, so this is going to be the source of output for this presynaptic neuron. And this is where neurotransmitter release needs to occur in order so that way you can excite this postsynaptic neuron and transmit the action potentials further down and towards the brain. Now to get neurotransmitter release, you're going to end up with vesicles, and the vesicles have the neurotransmitters. Now let's pretend that this neurotransmitter in here is going to be acetylcholine, and it's ultimately going to excite the neuron and lead to skeletal muscle contraction. Now on this vesicle that has a neurotransmitter, there are things called snares. In this case, they're called V snares, and the V snare, V stands for vesicle, the V snare is going to be important because it's going to bind to target snares on the membrane of this axon terminal. So snares, snares being snares which grab onto things, they're going to grab a hold of each other and they're going to essentially create a docking complex. So I like to think of it as a boat, aka the vesicle, coming in to dock, and the dock is the membrane. Now you have the snares, so you have snap 
25, which is a target snare. You have Syntaxin, which is another target snare. You have Synapto Brevin, which is a vesicle snare. The last thing that you do have is you have a calcium sensor. And the calcium sensor is going to be called Synapto Tagman, and it gets tagged with calcium. Now, when the action potential comes down and it activates voltage gated calcium channels at each axon terminal, calcium rushes in where there's a lower concentration of calcium, and calcium is going to bind to this synapto tagment, which is going to be the final push of this vesicle to this blue synaptic membrane. Now, once the calcium is in there, this vesicle is going to have a signal. And that signal is approach this membrane. And ultimately, it does end up approaching this membrane and it's going to create a docking complex with syntaxin and SNAP25 And you have synaptobrevin also forming that docking complex. And like I previously said, the last straw here is that calcium binds to synaptotagmin. And once it binds to synaptotagmin, it is going to push this vesicle right up against this membrane. It's going to push it up right there. And what's going to happen is it's going to allow for the fusion of the membrane of the vesicle along with with that membrane of the axon terminal and then what ends up happening is the neurotransmitters can then leak out essentially diffuse out to an area where there's a complete open space in the synapse where there is no neurotransmitters. So it goes from high concentration to low concentration. And as the neurotransmitters cross across the synapse, they're going to bind to specific receptors, ligand-gated receptors, which then are going to cause channels to open up. Sodium is going to rush in. And that is going to create a greater potential at this postsynaptic neuron, which is then going to excite to threshold. You're going to get an action potential at this axon hillock, and away goes a new action potential, ultimately to the brain, so that way you can interpret what is going on with that stimulus and create a response. Now, this is, again, just a summary. If you do want to go into more detail or get further explanation or different explanations on this big process here, definitely come to office hours. You can watch other videos as well, but probably the best way to learn this stuff is you draw it out yourself exactly like what I just did here. And you also, it's really helpful to get explanations in office hours.